Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Punch Card Investing. Uh, our, our host, our usual host, Jack, had another obligation, so it's just going to be the four of us today. Uh, but we're going to get into what our biggest investing mistakes have been. So uh, we get to make something of fools of ourselves today uh, in, in service of learning a few things. And hopefully you guys can learn from our mistakes rather than make these mistakes on your own. So are any of you itching to go first? I think Jack skipped this one on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> that, I accused him of that in the, in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. I Tom, think it, I can go first. If, yeah. I can go first if there's no volunteers. I've got a couple of mistakes. So I'm not sure which one everyone's <laughs> interested in hearing. I've got one that's sort of uh I guess what people would traditionally think of as an investment mistake, mistake being a permanent loss of capital, right? So that's probably what most people think of. But I've also got one that was probably a much larger mistake that was just a mistake of omission, something mm -hmm. I uh, should have bought and didn't and has gone up a lot after me not buying it. So um, maybe I'll, I might um, give you the, the quick backstory on the permanent loss of capital. Um, I've told the story a few times on different videos. So some people uh, may be getting this for, for the second time, but I'll give it to you anyway. So um, that was with a business called Fair Chrysler, which um, I think Brad, you may have owned it at one point mm -hmm. as well. So this was sort of in the early days of me discovering uh, one Mr. Monish Pabrai, and it was sort of a clone of uh, a position he had in his portfolio. And uh, interestingly enough, um, the loss of capital that I've had with Fiat Chrysler has actually shrunk quite a bit over the past year, which might sound like a strange thing to say, but I actually sold only about 70% of my position when I did get out of Fiat, Chry Fiat Chrysler. I sort of kept 30% as like schmuck insurance and that's <laughs> that 30% has done so well that um, I looked on my um, share site, which I used to track my portfolio just yesterday, and that permanent loss is down to only 18% now from, I think I was down maybe 40% when I, when I sold it, um, sold that sort of big chunk. So uh, yeah, I guess what, what happened, the original investment thesis was that Fiat Chrysler was going to grow its earnings to this point where it was going to be close to a PE of maybe two at the time, um, PE of one or two, that was kind of the... Um, the investment thesis, it's not one of these high quality long term compounders or anything, but that was kind of where I was at. Um, and essentially COVID and, and lockdowns kind of destroyed this investment. So um, Fiat Chrysler obviously produces cars. Um, they have a whole bunch of different brands under the hood at that business. Um, and the auto industry is sort of an okay business in good times. So they can earn modest profits. Um, they, at the time, were bringing in around $100 billion a year in revenue, but they were only earning maybe $3, 4000000000 billion a year in actual earnings. So that's quite a sort of low margin business. And one of the things that happens any time that that revenue takes a dive is that the earnings can go from you know, being modestly profitable to being very, very unprofitable quite quickly. And uh, when they had to shut all their factories and that sort of thing. I basically saw a pathway to where they were going to lose, you know, several years even potentially of um, of free cash flow, you know, in a very quick space of time, the sort of a lot of what you'd call operational leverage built into that business. So um, I, I chose to sell, um, like I say, about 70% of that company held on to a little bit. Um, and that's probably the biggest investment mistake I've had in terms of a permanent loss. Can I pepper you with a few questions about that one, Tom? Go for it. So when when did you get into Fiat Chrysler? I think Pabri bought in sometime around 2012. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I was pretty late to the party. Um, okay. Probably, I would say mid-2019, maybe even late 2019. Okay. So I only actually held it for maybe six months before I sold and and took that, that big loss. So yeah, Pabri had been in since like, four or five dollars a share back in yeah. 2012 or maybe even less than that um and it had run as high as like high 20s at one point i bought around 12 and then i think i sold most of my position around seven something like that ballpark okay when was yeah. the ferrari spinoff the ferrari spinoff was 2015 15 maybe? i think yeah ballpark okay. yeah, yeah. 
I can look up Ferrari stock chart, I guess, just whenever that starts would be, <laughs> would be when it was spun off. Um, got, yeah. So how much would you be up on the position if you had have held on? Do you Great know? question. Um, I'm just having a look at the chart now. I think they trade around seven or oh, sixteen fifty right now. So you bought in at twelve, is that right, Tom? Yeah, I'm actually. Uh, I won't share this because this has got real dollars from my actual portfolio. But I'm just going <laughs> to bring up my share side account because I can. Yeah. yeah, I the the thing that makes it a little bit trickier to calculate. It's probably actually worked out better than the stock chart suggests because I've paid quite large special dividends and things right. as well. Mm -hmm. um, let me have so a when look. The, when they switched the names, how much did they pay out as a dividend? Like some huge number, right? Yeah, I'll bring up the amount. Oh, ju just recently you're talking about? Yeah, so so what's that in percentage terms? Uh, yeah, okay, here we go. So I would have, if I'd held, uh, it's, it's telling me my annualized return would be about 17% a year in the green. So <laughs> if, I'd, if I'd held the full stake. Um, so there you go. There you have it. That's a double whammy mistake. But I've got about... Um, I've got about 11% of my capital back through dividends from the special dividend. Okay. And so you said you kept 30% of the position, is that right? Mm -hmm. Approximately, so yeah. overall, did you still almost make money on this or you're still down significantly after selling 70%? Yeah, I'm down, um, I've got it right here actually. Uh, I'm down overall 18.88% at the moment. So um, okay. yeah. Not all that bad, I guess, in the grand scheme. So is this now cash for you? Is it like cash equivalent or is it something that you'd hold on to? Uh, yeah, I'm going to continue to hold it. I think uh, what's actually happening at the moment. So the recovery has been way better than I ever expected um, with the business. And they've now merged with the PSA group to become Stellantis is sort of the name of the new company. Uh, and I really like the management team at that business. And I still don't think, I think it's still cheap if they can even get moderately close to executing on some of the things that they've got planned. So um, it's not a significant portion of the portfolio now um, after selling that that chunk down. So I'm just going to hold it and, and see what happens. Was a merger part of Sergio's vision? I'm sorry if I'm asking too many questions, but like... No, go for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, merger, the merger definitely was. So one of the things that... Yeah, so Sergio Marchione, for anyone listening in, used to be the... CEO of Fiat Chrysler, and he was a CEO when Probri invested and has passed away since. But um, yeah, one of his major visions for Fiat Chrysler was for it to merge with another company. There's a one of the main reasons that auto businesses aren't that profitable is but because they spend a huge amount of money on R and D and constantly sort of revising, you know, the models of of cars every year and so on. And there's a lot of overlap with that R and D. So. And there's also a lot of overlap with parts that don't necessarily have to be differentiated between brands. So, for example, um, you probably, if you've ever gone and bought a new car, you probably haven't made that buying decision based on the sound of the horn, for example. So, you know, if Fiat Chrysler can afford to um, only spend R&D money on developing a horn once and spread that across all of the brands, um, they don't have to you know, spend that money on R&D for Fiat and Chrysler and Jeep and Maserati and Ferrari and so on. So the more brands that you can kind of get under the hood with a merger, the more you kind of spread a lot of those R&D costs. And that, um, I forget the numbers off the top of my head, but Sergio was thinking of in the billions and billions of dollars a year and potential cost savings from a merger. So that, that's what they're trying to execute on at the moment. Yeah, I've noticed Great. with the Jeep cars, they all have the same badge at the back, irrespective of the model. So, yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's something I noticed after we found out about Fabri's investment. Yeah, I mean, there's there's certainly a lot of car parts that have to be differentiated. Like, you wouldn't want to get into a into a Jeep and have, like, a Fiat steering wheel, right? Like, there's some things that do have to be different, but there's a lot of, uh, there's a surprisingly large percentage of parts that really don't have to be that different between brands. Cool. Well, thanks for sharing, Tom. Uh, no Karan, do, do you have a, a mistake you'd like to share with us? No. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> You've had a perfect track record. Yeah. So it's wonderful. Last year, I had like mistakes, like consecutive mistakes. So <laughs> I'll be talking about the second one. 
because the first one was the airlines and i've talked about it in a separate video so airlines airlines i think it i i wouldn't say it's a mistake like i don't think a pandemic wasn't like anyone's <laughs> prediction so airlines crashing you know i think everyone kind of went down with that but the second mistake was uh, so i invested in this like indian mining company and um, you know commodities were really down back in march so this is a company called vedanta have any of you heard of it no no so it's this indian mining company that was formed by a series of mergers so they have exposure to a lot of commodities so they've got exposure to oil to iron to copper zinc silver and they're actually a low cost producer of zinc and um, the way they're growing they could have been like uh, one of the top producers of silver also and uh, the stock basically went from around 9 to 10 dollars so it's traded on the american markets too and uh, it went from around 9 to 10 dollars to around 3 dollars so you know 60% drop and then i'm interested like i want to see mm. and uh, like even i mean copper prices commodity prices in general were just really you know all time lows during march so i figured it makes sense like even if it comes back to what is fair value and fair value for this business was closer to like 20 dollars per share the only reason i didn't buy in earlier is because of commodity price and i didn't see the margin of safety but now there was a margin of safety everything made sense so i decided to buy in around 3.5 3.7 dollars around that price and uh, everything seemed fine and uh, a month later we got an announcement saying that this business was being delisted so the founder who controls a majority of this company decided to be opportunistic and just take the entire company private at all time lows right because he controls i think around 55% or something a little bit more because he's got subsidiaries and family members also you know controlling different subsidiaries so he tried to take the entire business private at around $5 and that was a risk i had not anticipated mm -hmm. right and ever since then i've kind of been like a bit wary about businesses where the founder has too much control of the business that was my first thought actually when frank mentioned um, kelly partners yeah yeah that so that, that reminds me a lot that reminds me a lot of um graph tech actually there was a lot of concern about a potential buy under with graph tech with brookfield asset management owning 80 percent of it or something when when Pabri first got in the the other thing that that came to mind when you started um talking about zinc i thought that was going to be like a horsehead holdings 2.0 <laughs> story i saw brad <laughs> smile as well when you said that i don't know if that's what ran through your head as it well is, or yeah. not, brad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were the recycling business, right? Zinc recycling. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, what did so you think what, of the management team going into it? Like, did you think this was a high quality management team? You like the CEO? Honestly, I mean, I saw the possibility of a like three x in like one year, and I was like, yeah, I'm going at it. I didn't really worry about the management as much because I'm like, it's driven by commodity prices. So, and by the way, the stock has gone up around 300% uh, since the lows. So that happened. The reason- Oh, so the buy way, under never actually yeah. happened to that. Yeah, it didn't actually happen because mm. um, one of the largest shareholders who is like a financial institution in India, uh, they said that they want a price of 320 rupees per share. And the price at the lows in March was around 60, 65 rupees per share. So it's a straight 5x, right? That's the actual true value of the business. And um, and yeah, the founder just didn't want to pay that. So mm. that was that. I got how, out how were like you, a month later. How were you arriving at the fair value of $20? Because that's, um, that's one of the things I struggle with with commodity companies is trying to assess intrinsic value because typically the earnings are so volatile just with what prices are doing year to year we looking at like replacement cost of the assets or lower liquidation value or were you trying to normalize commodity prices or how, how, how do you think about that yeah so uh, in terms of i did like a sum of the parts so they've got different subsidiaries so i looked at each of them went through it and 
you know got it rough because there's no way to be sure at all so probably i thought it'll be around 20 dollars because that's also what it had been in the past so at a time when copper was higher zinc was higher commodities were higher in general it was around 20 so i figured it could be around that much i figured it's just so low the price is so low it's you know um like it's very difficult to lose money from this point onwards and that and that don't to be true yeah cool so sorry karan i'm a little dense right now what, what can you distill what was the the learning what was the lesson what was the mistake there yeah looking at uh, companies that have a high founder control like okay. twice making sure that yeah you know the founder does have control but really looking to the integrity of the management i see yeah yeah Makes sense. Yeah, I think it's important when insider ownership is high, particularly over 50% of the company, they, you really need to have faith in that management team. Mm -hmm. So Kelly Partners was brought up and Brett Kelly being the CEO. Um, I have faith in him. If you listen to him enough and read enough about him, I guess it comes across as an okay risk to take. But um, yeah, I guess if it's a management team you don't really understand well enough, that certainly is a, it's not always positive for insider ownership to be high, I guess. Do you mm. think Brett Kelly would take the company, like try to take the company private if this, suddenly there was an irrational drop in the stock? Not a chance. Uh, he would just, nah, if there was any irrational drop, he'd, yeah, he'd, be, he'd be buying back hard. He's a, the most recent investor presentation, I sent it to you in the Instagram chat that we have. Um, reading through that, that just made me like him even more. He's gone through, he's posted all these books and learnings from the books throughout his investor presentation. Mm all these Warren Buffett quotes and quotes from the book, The Outsiders, which is one of my favorite books. And um, I have a friend that works at the company and Brett Kelly also makes all the employees read those books when they sign up for the company. So just a super unique manager um, in general. But yeah, I definitely don't have a concern of him going private at any time. Cool, well, thank you, Karan. Uh, Frank, did you wanna share your biggest mistake of omission with us? Yeah, I've got a few little mistakes I'll talk about. I haven't made a real significant mistake and I'm sure it'll come along. I'm not going to pretend like I won't make mistakes, but um, of the six or seven years or so I've been investing, most of it was holding index funds or ETFs here in Australia. So it was hard to make a mistake in the doing that. It still always will be hard to make a mistake. But um, when I started the stock pick, I guess one mistake I made was my approach towards investing. I decided to do this strategy where I'd keep half of my portfolio in the ETFs and then I was stock picking, which there'd be nothing wrong with that usually, but I was pretty speculative with my investments. I made a few, I, I got lucky, I'm gonna, not going to lie, a lot of those investments worked out well, but I did not understand the businesses whatsoever. There's a company here in Australia called EOS, Electro Optic Systems, and I still really couldn't tell you much about the business. Like I, on, <laughs> I held that for almost a year, maybe a bit longer, had a good return and I, I still don't know what they do. So I made those mistakes early on and just got lucky. But since I've really spent the time to learn and I've narrowed down to the approach that I follow now, the biggest mistake I probably made was SRG, um, which I think you all hold SRG still, is that right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm, yes. I'm the only one to take a loss on that one. And, um, I kind of, I probably rushed into it. I don't think I really understood um, where the business could go. I saw Monish doing it. I saw everyone talking about it. I knew it was a pretty hot stock. I knew it was undervalued, but I didn't really see the long-term growth in the business. So when management were moving around, they didn't have a CEO there for a while. Um, the cash burn was super high. I got out at about a 12% loss, I think. It was about 10% loss, but 12% with um, currency as well. So I could have just held on that. Now I'd be up about 20% or so on the position, but I guess not really understanding that business well enough. That was a mistake really, I just sold too early. And then the most recent mistake I've made, um, I won't call this a complete mistake because I'm happy to hold the position, but I just bought into a stock called Redbubble, not financial advice, of course. Um, and I knew there was an announcement coming out. I knew they'll have to 
talking about their earnings coming out soon. So I bought into the stock sooner than I probably wanted to. It was top of my watch list for a long time. And I kind of think I just got into it a little bit early. And the announcement that came out was bad for the short term. Um, so I took a 20% loss that day. So I bought it the next day, it dropped 20%. Um, I doubled down on my position because long term, I don't think there's a problem there. But if I had just waited, I would have had a perfect opportunity to buy it at a much lower price than I thought it was worth. So I guess just not being patient was another mistake I made there. Mm -hmm. But at the, at the same time, I mean, you, you still believe that was a, at a big margin of safety and it could easily have gone 20% the other way, right? Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. So there was no there's no way I could know what was going to happen there. But um, I guess that I just didn't want to wait. So I got in. And yeah, you're right. If it had gone up 20 percent that day, it would have been a different type of mistake, I guess. So it's just one of those things you can't predict. So yeah. can I ask you about Seritage real quick? Uh, was it a mistake to buy in or was it a mistake to sell? Or, you know, how do you think about that? I personally wish I didn't buy in. Oh. Um, one, it's not the type of business I typically look for. I don't see it as a long-term compounder, which is the type of businesses I was looking for. I saw the value of it. I did think it was a good opportunity and I took it, but I don't think it matched my strategy and I didn't have the conviction. So I sold out because I, the conviction wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And um, with every other stock in my portfolio, like Redbubble took that hit, Twitter's taken a hit. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna sell those positions because I feel comfortable holding those. And I just, I wasn't there with Seritage. Gotcha. Twitter cool. fell 15 You're up, percent, by the way, if you guys didn't know, yesterday. What's that, sorry? Twitter fell 15% yesterday. Was yeah, that on, on earnings? On too. Well, less on earnings, more on their users. So they forecasted lower user growth moving forward. Mm. So 15% um, drop. Yeah. Essentially, they had a three-year plan they're about 70 days into it and there's been a reaction to people <laughs> saying they're not going to meet their three-year plan and it's it's just started. So the CFO made that point today. He was on a um, Twitter spaces with uh, Elliot Turner and he made that oh, point wow. and it's been plastered out all over Twitter now and um, I kind of I kind of agree with that more. It's, it's really true. And when I first saw it, I was like, oh, maybe I bought into the hub a little bit. I was feeding into it a little bit, but no, nah, that makes me feel a lot more comfortable. It's pretty stupid to worry about it so soon. Yep. Uh, Elliot Turner, I assume he owns it. Do you know how big of a conviction it is for him? I'd assume it's pretty large. I know he runs yeah. a fairly concentrated portfolio. Yeah. I don't know his portfolio, but from what he talks about, and he's been pushing that for about three or four years now. He's, um, mm -hmm. I think he presented it at the, I don't know, one of the big conferences anyway. He's presented it a few times and he's pretty public about that position. So I'd assume it's at least 10, 15% of his portfolio. Gotcha. Cool. All right. Thank you, Frank. We've got what you got for us, Brad? Uh, what do I got? Did you say something, Karan, about Twitter? So we've got some pretty good. We've got Tom Gaynor in it, Guy Spio, Bill Miller, yeah. David Teppo. It's an David impressive Einhorn. lineup. Yeah, it's... it's Really impressive. I just saw it. Yeah. Hmm. Um, okay. So it was probably sometime around 2015, 2016 that I started picking uh, individual stocks. And 2016, June 2016, I decided to buy Apple. Okay. I think I, I beat Warren Buffett into Apple. So I was I was feeling you pretty take good. His job. <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's right that may be uh, open still huh um well when i say the next thing maybe he won't be as interested um so i buy in june 2016 and i'm not exactly sure what was going through my head but i sold just over a year later okay i was up like 50 percent in a year you know, I got I got the long term gains taxes. I'm feeling I'm feeling good. Fifty percent. Uh, if if I had held that position, I'd be up over five times in a little under five years. So a forty one percent compound annual growth rate. Uh, and I just wanted to pull something up. See if I can share my screen. I haven't done this before. You guys, let me know if it's working. 
Nothing just yet. Yeah. How so big was, was your position? Po- Sorry. What's that? How big was the position in your portfolio? What type of weighting? Uh, it, it wasn't big. Uh, I, w- I was just kind of starting to get comfortable uh, buying individual securities. So, you know, it wouldn't have made a huge difference at this point. But uh, what I wanted to pull up was from Morningstar, uh, just what the, you know, price of earnings has done, what the earnings yield was back in 2016. I think it was even on the magic formula screener. Like it was a top 30, you know, minimum 50 million market cap Apple. So, you know, I, I knew it was cheap and I just didn't have that conviction to hold on, or I didn't have that framework yet, that framework of just buying and holding, letting the company compound the money rather than, you know, trying to outsmart, you know, these, these great businesses. So, uh, it feels like a really timely learning as I kind of shift a little bit more into the, the long-term compounders. Uh, so it's something I'm, I'm trying to drill into my head. So Apple. Yeah. So, um, so can, can you recall why you sold? You were just happy, like you were just happy with 50, you know, I think it, it, it was, which it is was, a nice way to make a mistake, by the it way. It was but. my framework. <laughs> it was my framework at the moment. Um, yeah. You know, buy a couple stocks a year, hold for just over a year. You know, I think I, I was exposed to Joel Greenblatt's, you know, method early on with, with the magic formula. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, it was just kind of how I was going about it. Um, so, but yeah, I'm kicking myself. Yeah, interesting. I'm just, um, I'm not sure if you're still trying to share that, Brad, but I didn't see no, a chart come I'm up. Um, I'm, I'm just looking up some PE ratio history for Apple as well, and it doesn't look like they got over 20 times earnings until late 2019 even. It was down there for That's a right. while. And, and, yeah. and from memory, they were really starting to, they had a, quite a bit of cash in 2016, as I recall it as well, and were really starting to, pump buybacks yeah. and increase dividends and things as well, which obviously has worked out really well through. Yeah, I think now. it was a it was a PE of twelve when I bought it and currently it's a PE of thirty. At the end of last year it was yeah. up to forty. Mm. They got as low as about ten times earnings um, in two thousand and sixteen as well. I'm just looking at the chart at the moment. Right. And I yeah, saw the acquirers re- multiple was was ten. Acquirers multiple yeah, was it's ten. A, yeah. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. If you look at it on an EV basis or even yeah. like a, if you back out the cash, it might have been more like eight times earnings even because they had so much sitting there at that point. Right, right. So much I'm cash compared EV to that. EV to EBIT got as low as six, I'm oh. looking at. Yeah, there you go. Which is pretty crazy for a it's, company it's like nuts. Apple. It's nuts. I know they were going through a time period where a lot of people, I think we talked about this on your podcast, Tom, that I did with you. Um mm-hmm. It was seen as a hardware company and they thought these margins were going to contract moving forward. So a lot of the big shareholders thought the growth was done. It's a hardware company. There's nowhere to go. Margins are going to contract over time. But I think if you could see it as more of a software company than it really is and all the different ways they could generate revenue, it was definitely a great mm-hmm. opportunity, which is, I guess, what Buffett saw around that same time. And it's probably been yeah. one of his best investments, I guess. I mean, I'm sure the app store was was cranking out cash at that point, right? Yeah, mm. for sure. And yeah, just how I mean, strong that, the brand was too. Like, I think yep. that was pretty underestimated until the last five years or so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, people were concerned about, you know, people keeping their iPhones longer before they upgraded and all that sort of thing. And I think they had probably their first flat or down year of iPhone sales mm. ever. But at the same time, the services business was compounding at like 30% a year or something from a small base, it, you know, granted, but it was becoming a more important part of, of, of the business. And I'm, I'm uh, blanking on the details a little bit here, but I think another concern people had with that cash was it was in Ireland and all these offshore accounts and stuff, and they were worried about like big tax hits and things as well. Um, so potentially that, 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 you know, meant that people didn't give the cash maybe the credit it might have deserved. Mm-hmm. So I'm just looking at the revenues um, since 2010. They were increasing just approximately about 30% on average through to 2016, and then they took a loss of about 7% down on their revenues. Mm. So I guess that's when people thought 
Show us over. In a bit of trouble. Yeah. yeah. But boy, were they wrong. Sure were. Mm. I think the biggest yeah. catalyst for Apple was Carl Icahn taking the stake in 2016. Because he's yeah. the one who kind of made them get into buybacks, right? Before that, that was not really a thought for the company. Mm. So I think he has been a huge catalyst to change. Although he got out, I think, in 2016. So Do you know what, what size stake he took? I think he bought in like one or two billion. Okay. Yeah. I mean, because yeah. he's usually an activist style investor, isn't he? Right. Yeah, yeah. He was, yes, he was looking to use the cash better. Yeah. So that was his intention. And I think Buffett bought in, I mean, around the same time, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, you've got to be a pretty serious activist to make the needle move at Apple, don't you? Yeah. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> I was like, how yeah, activist can you be? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Activist, can you go on a company that big? Yeah, I think for sure. Like hey, taking a stake anywhere makes a difference. Like just his name, yeah. <laughs> you mm. know, associated with a company kind of shakes management up a bit. Yeah, yeah, hundred yeah, percent. And he's sort of like a, he's not one of those activist type people that will come in for six months and try and get a pop out of the stock. He's often hanging around for several years as well, which I, I again don't think he gets. Um, that's not perhaps as much appreciated as it should be either. Same with Bill Ackman, actually. He held on Hertz till bankruptcy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, crazy. I, mean, I know Tom was invested before in Hertz, it, but before it turned into a meme, <laughs> yeah. before it turned into a meme and went up ten x or whatever it was, yeah. I think he sold before that all happened. Hey, one thing I was just going to say on mistakes, um, while we're while we're still on that topic, is um, I think it's important to recognise that mistakes are just par for the course, as Prabhu would say, like. Um, the having having mistakes should be expected and even Warren Buffett has a very long list of mistakes and you can still have a very good investment track record even with all of those things mixed in. I think if you try to go out and invest without, you know, ever having a mistake, you're probably not gonna do particularly well, I would say. <laughs> and um and one of the things that that I would also say is um perhaps this isn't the case with some of the examples you guys gave. I'm I'm not sure. Um Perhaps Quran, it might be, maybe you can let me know. But one of the things that I often think about with my investment in Fiat Chrysler and the way that that turned out is if I were presented that same situation with the same you know, odds again, would I make that investment again? And I think um, for a lot of, I think I would probably make that same bet again. I think it's just the way that that turned out. I think in, in most, the most probable situation was that they grew to earn, you know, something that put the current price at two times earnings and it works out well. But I think we had this black swan event that, you know, this low probability event that kind of just came in and destroyed that investment. So although we can learn from mistakes, I think um, I'm pulling out all the bright quotes here, but it's important not to learn too much from, from some of these things. Like you do have to just move on and, and, you know, sometimes things can come out of left field. Yeah. Yeah. That's well, very true. And any of us who, you know, got really good grades in school, it, it's it's a totally different game than that, right? You can't get straight A's in investing. Yeah. It's a it's a probabilities based game. And Pabri says what the be- even the best investors are going to be wrong thirty percent of the time. So uh, it's it's a different game than the one that many of us are used to, which is part of what makes it so challenging. I yeah. think it's about Absolutely. position sizing. Also, that's a huge factor. So mm-hmm. um, if you equal weight positions. And you get like two third, I mean one third of them wrong. I mean, yeah, you're going to get hit pretty badly. But then, you know, the good, the good investments tend to concentrate the portfolio. I think so. Yeah, that works out. Yeah, and that's the way I've viewed Seritage actually. I, I sort of see Seritage as, you know, asymmetric outcomes where, um, you know, I think the likelihood of that working out well is better than the likelihood of it working out poorly. And I think, um, not investment advice again, but I think the the potential upside is far, far greater than the potential downside. But I think there is still a reasonable risk of that, you know, potentially dying a slow death and going going to zero over time. So I think that's the type of position that, for me at least, maybe you guys have different opinions, perhaps deserves to be a smaller proportion of the portfolio, because I think the risk of it turning into a donut is a, is a little bit higher than, you know, something like an Apple or some high quality business. What's your take on that, Karan? I, I think the biggest thing with Seritage is the fact that they can't go bankrupt. At least I don't think they can. 
like that probability seems very low because the debt is just <laughs> held by Berkshire. So mm -hmm. it depends. I think um, I think if they like, I agree that they're not going to go bankrupt tomorrow. That's it's that just can't happen yeah. with the assets Slow they've down. got. But I think there's a meaningful chance that it can you know, over a five or 10 year period, it could just slowly go down. Slow down. burn. Yeah. The cash burn is pretty real. real. It's yeah. definitely a possibility. No, but they got like rent of what, 33, $34 per square foot or something. I read it somewhere, I think on Seeking Alpha. So, I mean, going from four or $5 to like 34, clearly their properties are good, right? They wouldn't be able to charge such high rent relative to everything else. Clearly there's yeah. value in the property, so. I don't know. I think it's yeah. okay. Even if, if it's an okay investment, it's fine. Yeah. Mm. Should we dive into a few of these uh, comments? Yeah, we've got a few coming through, so I'm happy to have a go at Tom. Sure. Uh, Matthew Scott, interested in all your thoughts on the potential hyperinflation on the horizon and if that's something affecting your investing outlook. Tom's got a big smile. Maybe we'll pitch it to him first. Uh, no thoughts and no <laughs> <laughs> Tom's not a macro guy. Yeah, I I pay attention to a lot of macro stuff, but it doesn't affect the way I invest. So I do think we're going to go through some type of fairly high rate of inflation. We probably already are, um, but it's not going to change the way I'm invest. I'm going to investing. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. Um, I'm not going to go and buy some crypto or gold or whatever you want to choose. But yeah. I'm paying attention to it, but it's not affecting the way I invest. Is it fair to say the best antidote to hyperinflation is just owning great businesses, Frank? Is that is that John? Bitcoin, Bitcoin, bro. <laughs> where is Where is yeah. Bitcoin, bro? <laughs> I, should I go change? No, no, no. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I think that I think the best antidote to yeah to hyperinflation is owning good businesses with pricing power and or um, this might be a something that doesn't get talked about probably enough in value investing circles, but potentially also having debt on um, on assets that can go up with inflation, like real estate, for example. Because you're borrowing money and, and buying assets in today's dollars, but paying yeah. it back in tomorrow's dollars, you know, very inflated. Yeah, I can't I see myself making that. Yeah. yeah, I don't think I'll ever make a hedge to inflation, but if I was, I'd be thinking more so towards um, a company with great pricing power moving forward, like a Coca-Cola is something that Buffett kind of has, whether it was intentional or not. Um, Ray Dalio has a lot of those type of companies, the Alibaba's, uh, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, companies like that. Um, I guess that's a good move to make. And then there's real estate is another option. I don't think I'd move towards gold or crypto or anything like that. It's a little bit too unpredictable. But realistically, I'm just happy to buy great businesses and Write it out. Cool. Karan, did you have anything to add before we jump to the next one? I mean, I kind of like something that I read uh, recently in that book, the book you mentioned, Richer, Wiser, Happier, mm -hmm. about Matthew McLennan. And um, he does hold gold in his portfolio, and he, he's in the chapter called The Resilient Investor. Hmm. So I kind of thought about the way he kind of structured gold in his portfolio. He's like, it exists as a hedge that makes sense but at the same time i mean gold it's worth what the next person is willing to pay for it okay. so it makes more sense to hold a company like berkshire i think um that's a better hedge than gold i would say i mean berkshire is a tough example I, I agree with what you mean but because they hold so much cash that one's yeah. a little bit but yeah it, it is good to hold a business like that i guess you want resilience, and right. you want like anti-fragility in the portfolio. So I think Berkshire is as anti-fragile as they come, you know. Yeah, and if diversification, like I think Ray Dalio's portfolio is designed exactly for this. So if you really want a better idea, I think Dalio is the best person to listen to. And he has a lot of gold, gold ETFs and um, mm -hmm. maybe a few other hedges in there too. But a lot of these companies with pricing power, he has markets from all over the world. It's as bad as about as diversified as you can get. Yeah, it's, it seems like it's tough to see into a lot of what they're doing uh, because all we can see is the 13F filing, really. Is, would you agree with that, Frank? 
Sorry, I was reading a question. I didn't listen to that. Oh, no problem. Uh, with with Bridgewater, it seems like it's hard to get a lot of transparency about what they're investing in because only yeah. a small fraction of it is disclosed in the 13F. Yeah, that's true. And there's also a lot of ATS in there. You'd have to really dig into all those different ATS and what they're actually holding. It is hard to really get a grasp on, but yeah, you can kind of get the idea of what he's doing with the portfolio. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys you see any... Think about the what do you think about the all weather portfolio? The one with like 70% bonds or some 40% bonds, some ridiculous number. Any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I read about it in a Tony Robbins book, I want to say, Money yeah. Master the Game. I think it was mentioned in there. I, I like the concept, but um, I mean, Ray Dalio laid out of sort of some asset allocation percentages for the all weather portfolio in that book. But even then he made it very clear to Tony Robbins that he was kind of dumbing it down and there's, yeah. um, you know, there's leverage and options and all sorts of derivatives built into that portfolio as well. So I like the idea of something that can perform, you know, fairly well in most environments, but whether or not you could actually replicate it in real life is a whole other question. I mean, I, I imagine Ray's talked recently about moving away from bonds. Right? Have you heard him talk about bonds recently? Anybody? He keeps saying they're trash. Cash is trash, bonds are trash. That's all he keeps saying. Yeah, bonds are trash. <laughs> so, I mean, bonds were a big part of the all-weather portfolio, weren't they? Like 55% yeah, or something? Yeah, yeah. Some so you'd have to figure out how to redistribute that. Mm. Yeah, we're in a we're in a weird time uh, yeah. where where people are buying stocks for their income and they're buying bonds for capital gain because interest rates keep going down. Right. Uh, that's about I've, backwards to normal. <laughs> I've got another good question here if you just want to have a go. I think we sure. might disagree on this one. I'm not sure. Uh -huh. uh, so from Anthony Hall, it says, in general, would you choose a shameless clone of stock that is selling under the super investor's purchase price or a small mid cap you found in your own research that is within your margin of safety? within your circle of competence or margin? Yeah, well, I guess if it's from your own research and you've yeah. got your margin of safety, you would have that conviction. Sure. So would you rather yes. your own conviction or a super investor's conviction, I guess? Yeah. Your own conviction. Oh. I think. Yeah, I, I don't think I, I... So I don't clone... <laughs> I, I have your mug around that says shameless cloners and I'm shameless <laughs> when I clone, but I, I, don't, um, I don't blindly clone, I guess. So... Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't quite know how to how if that answers the question or not, but I wouldn't buy something without researching it first, like, and I'd be equally as comfortable with an own idea that I find because the stuff that these investors just can't buy, like Buffett can't buy Kelly Partners, you know, like Frank did, and that sort of thing. It's should, just too small. He, so. <laughs> he could own the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, I think the problem with cloning is conviction, so it's not knowing when to sell. I think that's the hardest thing. If you don't know the business well enough and you completely shameless clone, I guess, um, I think that's where you can run into some problems. I think cloning the way I see the value of it is just idea sourcing. And that can come from the super investors, smaller investors, you guys on YouTube, friends, whatever. Like, It's just idea generation at the end of the day. I think if you're going to shamelessly clone, the best way would be to come up with some strategy where a quantitative approach where you really don't touch it. I, I don't know how you'd set that up. I know Brad had a video about it and I laid out a comment that I don't even mm -hmm. know if I agree with completely, but just a real quantitative approach where you can ignore it, not touch it, and be strict about it that way because you can run into some trouble if you sell out of these positions. Like if you find out Munger just bought Alibaba, for example, if it, he could have sold it right now and we don't have any idea. And if you don't have the conviction on that stock yourself, you're holding a stock that he doesn't even own anymore. So, mm. Yeah, and I think it's important to clone the right people because a bit of large amount of money that Charlie Munger hasn't sold Ali, Alibaba because he never has a transaction just about. Yeah, that's true. So, so that's part of it as well. Like if you look at someone like Michael Burry, for example, he would not be someone that would be yeah. that easy to clone necessarily because he's got very high portfolio turnover. Um, so, yeah, it depends kind of on the on the – investor as well yeah yeah i'd say for me um i really you know i really do want to see that there's an investor that i have a lot of respect for uh that owns the business before i buy it i you know i don't really see any reason to go fully out on my own and and 
you know, find these companies, have to vet them from, from head to toe. I don't have experience as an entrepreneur. So there's, there's a lot of holes in my ability to fully, you know, understand the, the investment prospects of a business. So I'm, I'm in the bowling with bumpers camp. Uh, of course, I want to understand the business, but that's a really important starting filter for me is that, you know, another great investor has already bought it. You know, it's not something I really want to compromise on at this point. Maybe that'll change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, and I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to this question, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Both yeah. both can work. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. you can change even during phases. So there are times when it makes sense to go into smaller micro cap companies and there are times when it makes sense to go into more mid cap. So, I mean, it's not yeah. about timing, but, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Got another question here um, from Eric Coop. What is the most expensive company you have ever purchased? What are you? What are your guys on the Graham Fisher spectrum of value investing? So I guess he's asking how much have you paid up, and yeah, I like that idea of the spectrum. Does anyone want to have a crack at that one? Yeah, I, I can go first. Um, the yeah, so I am on, I am on all points of that spectrum, I would say. So <laughs> I, I'm equally as open to buying a cigar butt that's falling apart and has a bunch of assets as I am to, um, th there is probably a ceiling, like I'm not going to pay 200 times earnings <laughs> for something, but uh, you know, I'd, I'd happily pay a P of 30. I'm just pulling numbers out of thin air a bit here, but mm -hmm. I'd happily pay a P of 30 if I you know, thought the business was going from some small base and had a very clear long runway to grow very fast for a long time. So um, equally open to most things on that spectrum. Is there a specific price you have paid? For, like, I'll give an example of mine. I know I've paid about 35 times earnings, I think it was, for Over the Wire. Um, again, I should say not financial advice, but that's a company I hold here in Australia. But there was yep. a lot of underlying uh, underlying earnings to that. They had made some acquisitions that haven't been accounted for yet. So if you project that out into the future, they're kind of trading. They were closer to maybe f oh, I don't remember off the top of my head, maybe fifteen times earnings. I'm um, looking twelve months out into the future. But I guess you could say I did pay thirty five times earnings approximately for the business. So I'm not opposed to buying something because it's cheap, uh, because it appears expensive as long as I think it's cheap and there's that runway for growth. Yeah, I think um, probably 20, 25 would be the example for me. But again, you know, PE ratios, we all know, don't don't factor in growth. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you if you ask me, you could take a business that trades at three times earnings and a business that trades at 50 times earnings, and they could have very different multiples of 20, 30 earnings, for example, because one's growing much faster and one might be shrinking. So, yeah. But yeah, yeah, to answer the question, it's probably 25, something like that. And I think with that spectrum idea, like between Fisher and Graham, there's great things to learn from both people. And although they're kind of opposing, opposing strategies, there's no reason you can't take bits of both to find the ideal investment. Yeah. Uh, well, all of you know I'm, I'm a Pabrai cloner. And Pabrai, in his latest talk at Columbia, talks about how you know, when Ben Graham wrote securities analysis, he had just come out of the Great Depression. He was very focused on limiting the downside in terms of hard assets. Okay, he was looking at net nets, things like that. Um, of course, what, what Buffett has moved into with, with Apple and, and some of his other bets, uh, there's the brand value that can also provide some downside protection. Um, so I'm Kind of shifting kind of more towards the fisher end looking for you know longer runways uh, rather than cheaper up front that's that's kind of what my evolution is currently it'd be great to have both different. right it'd be great to have both but leaning more towards the the growth end i think you follow john huber as well brad i think you've yeah. made a couple of videos about him and he says he talks about finding margins of safety in the growth and within the returns on invested capital so there's another way yeah you don't have to look at the sheer value there's also a margin of safety with how much something can grow if you are certain that that growth is there i guess it's another way to look at that almost downside protection in a way yep yep yeah i recently bought into palantir 
Oh. And then I sold out of Palantir. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, what? Yeah. Tell, yeah, tell us. Out. Tell us what happened. Yeah, that's that's been the most expensive. <laughs> what was and the what I, was it on an expensive basis? Whatever metric you want to use. Expensive, just it's too expensive. Yeah, that, it's too expensive. <laughs> that, there's no number. Okay. But um, yeah, I bought into it mainly because I wanted to understand the business most more than anything else. Mm -hmm. And I came to the conclusion that it's way too hard to understand. <laughs> mm. Like they're very secretive. Like right. you it, can never get a full perspective, a full understanding of this company. Their business is secrecy yeah. in a way, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you will, I don't think if anyone says, if any detail shareholder says it's completely in their circle of competence, Watch they must out. be very smart. <laughs> you know, they must be really smart. Yeah. Yeah. It's about 40 times sales at the moment. Yeah. 40 for, times I'm sales. Okay. Yeah. Um, they're not um, profitable yet, so there's no earnings basis. It's about 150 times cash flows and 30 times book, roughly. I mean, do they have any compelling long-term contracts that the you've CEO, seen that aren't showing up in the numbers? Or Yeah, the CEO know, the said that they expect to never be profitable. That's also... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He put it sounds in the good. 10K. That sounds oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but the Skywise platform, I thought that was very interesting. I mean... Um, so it it's forming like it's almost like it's changing the airline industry as a whole but you know again like something revolutionary you also need to pay a decent price for it and it's very difficult to get to that price you've got to think... hope it's going to earn something in the future right yeah yeah it sounds like the ceo isn't uh, doesn't care about yeah but i mean they're even investing in spacs so you know, they basically, I, again, I think they could be a spawner, an apex spawner at that, because they've got this one core business, which is their foundry platform and everything. And they're going to be investing in other, you know, embryonic spawns in a way. And I really think that this business could be great in the future. But again, the price today just seems ridiculous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons I like Kevin Curran in this discussion because he keeps us very open-minded about looking at Palantir and GameStop and all these things that I probably wouldn't have we, looked at for more than five we seconds to mention, before I knew we Curran. To so. GameStop, <laughs> oh yeah, it's the weekly GameStop <laughs> Well, I'll add in my now that we've mentioned it, my biggest investment stake is I talked with Curran back in around July last year, and I was talking to him about Kelly Partners. He was talking to me about GameStop. I thought it was a bad idea. He ended up hundred getting a hundred bagger. So what do I know? <laughs> no, we would have been better investing in each other's. I think I would have been. I regret not investing in. I think that should be the mistake: not investing in Kelly Partners. <laughs> yeah. Well, you missed out on two hundred percent. I missed out on a hundred bagger. So. It. I mean. <laughs> yeah. Who so, knows? I mean, Kelly Partners might end up being a hundred bagger from the price that you bought in. That's hope. So hope. I want to take you another comment here, uh, Jesse. My biggest mistake was not completely investing in the S and P 500 since I started. Been playing catch up ever since. Uh, it just brings up this question, you know, for each of us, what what gives us confidence uh, or some degree of belief that we're going to outperform the S and P 500 over the next decade or two? You know, why why do all of this work? So we can yeah, round robin that. that one. I'll kick us off again if you guys like. <laughs> sure. So I, um, yeah, I, look, I think um, the first thing is there there are no guarantees, which is a very important point to make. And we, we may well all get, well, you might have to make a few mistakes to reverse a hundred bagger Quran, but we might all get five or 10 years down the track and maybe be underperforming. But I think there's a lot of people with the philo exact philosophies that we all have that have good track records and, and um that is what essentially gives me confidence. You know, we see these studies out there that, um, you know, just indexing beats active management in 90 plus percent of cases over a 10 year period. But I think that professional active management industry is basically a lot of these heavily diversified funds that charge a lot of fees. And that's really the reason that they underperform. I don't think there's a lot of people that are, are willing to take the career risk, you know, if you're a professional investor of having a highly concentrated portfolio that's going to be more volatile over time. 
um, which is the strategy that we all you know tend to buy into so i think the fact that those active managed funds tend to underperform is probably more of a a consequence of just not employing a good framework and being too caught up on short-term results and trying to collect assets under management rather than right. good returns. So mm -hmm. uh, that's that's sort of the way I think about it. Yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunities that retail investors have that fund managers don't. Um, I'll say this a million times, but I think looking at smaller illiquid companies is one of the best ways to do that because these fund managers can't access it. But um, I'll admit that if I don't, continue to outperform, I'll go straight back to ETFs like I started with. I'm not going to sit there and keep trying to beat it if I'm not. I'm just trying to. I've got, I give myself about five years. I've mm. had a good first year of this strategy since I've deployed this strategy specifically. Um, so if over five years I've done well, I'll keep going. If not, I might switch back to a 50-50 type thing because I do enjoy the process so I can still have some fun, but protect my capital with some type of diversified ETF. Well, what, what's good. preventing you from changing your approach four years in, Frank, and then resetting the clock? So, so what do you mean? So, like, if I get <laughs> <laughs> like, well, oh, that, that didn't work, but this, this, this is going to work. I, I guess that could happen, but <laughs> I, I've got my strategy. I've I'm feeling comfortable with it now. I think I'm going to stick to it. I've got the framework set up. Um, but yeah, if it's not working, then I just I'm happy to just collect. Um, slow growth from a, some type of diversified ETF. Yeah, let's check in with Frank in 2025 and make sure he hasn't become an IPO investor or something <laughs> crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I might turn into a Bitcoin bro for real. Mm, mm -hmm. <laughs> I actually listened to um, uh, Bill Brewster's podcast. He had on uh, the Preston guy from... Pish. Yeah, Preston Pish, thank you. And... The, there's a lot of compelling cases that I've really been ignorant to. And I think Bill did a good job in that interview of trying to remove the biases that we have as value guys and just kind of categorizing ourselves in a certain way to be careful not to miss opportunities because it's out of our circle of competence or strictly follow, following the Church of Buffett or the Church of Berkshire. Um, there's a lot of good points. and I'm, I'm not saying I'm going to invest in Bitcoin. I still have some rules around how I invest my money, but I was pretty quick to shut down that idea. And so far, I can only say I've been completely wrong for about three or four years that I've thought about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've done the same thing with stocks as well. That's why I made that comment about Quran earlier, you know, looking at being open to looking at things like Palantir, which I would have just been completely closed off to because I see 500 Facebook posts about it a day in investor groups, you know, <laughs> and that's not typically the stuff that gets me interested. So, agreed. Yeah, I think being open in open minded is important, but you still need some type of framework to not fall into certain situations. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I think more than anything else, it's just interesting to learn how an entrepreneur thinks, especially with Palantir. It's because the founder has been with the company since day one. And he's still as committed to the business and he's still got the drive and still got that, you know, thing to keep going and keep growing this business. Like you can tell from an interview, like when someone is passionate about their work, it's interesting. Like, you know, you want to get into that company. I think, mm -hmm. I think that's what keeps stock picking more interesting as opposed to indexing also. At least for me. Yeah. I just noticed we've got Jack Duffley in the chat. He's not here today. If you weren't wow. here, his Jack. His Jack, biggest mistake us? was not smashing the like button. <laughs> yes, yeah, smash the like button. Get us to a thousand subscribers, everyone. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. Um, There's a couple so, more questions in here. If you want me to fire some away, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'll just choose one out. Most recent one. <laughs> I won't read that one. <laughs> I'm Why happy not, okay, to we will ask. actually. Why not keep it simple and go with Ark? Is what Sandeep has said. What are our thoughts on Ark in general? <laughs> um, it's my most hated, disliked video. I've <laughs> I put up one video talking about Ark and why I wouldn't invest with them. And it's like everyone's like, "You don't know anything. You don't get technology." <laughs> it's like, okay, yeah, God, I, relax. <laughs> yeah, um, I'd I'd rather. 
if I was to invest in, so I'm not going to talk about maybe ARK specifically, but let's just take, because there's a whole raft of like themed ETFs and stuff. And even ARK has like a, that business has a bunch of different ETFs. So if I was to become an ETF investor, or if I was interested in getting into, I don't know, genetic technologies or something, I think ARK has a fund on that. I'd rather look at the individual businesses and buy one of those after doing some work. And if I wanted to be an ETF investor, I'd probably just buy an index. So, um, you know, buying sort of a themed ETF doesn't fit either of those categories for me. Yeah, if you're going yeah. with ETFs, go broadly diversified, global, tax efficient, low cost, all that good yeah. stuff. Yeah. I think that's the whole point of index investing is to be diversified. Otherwise, you may as well try stock picking. And I know mm -hmm. with ARK specifically, I go through their holdings and have a look to see if there's anything interesting because I love the types of things they're looking for. I just don't like the prices they're paying for those businesses. Mm. Yeah, um, I just had, um, I've lost the question, but um, I forgot to bring it up actually when I was talking about my investment mistake, about um, my mistake of omission. So. The mistake of omission I had was um, corporate travel management, which is a business on the ASX, um, and that's gone and gone up four or five x, I think, maybe four x since I um, didn't buy it. <laughs> that was right in the midst of the of um, lockdowns and things last year. They're basically like a travel agency, as the name might suggest, and had uh, something like thirty percent a year revenue and earnings growth leading into me looking at that, and then the business um, had a pretty rough. Um, 2020, as you can probably imagine. But uh, I came across that business purely just because um, the price had gone down so much. And Hamish Hodder, another YouTuber who a um, few of us probably know, um, he had talked about it back uh, when it was like three times higher than the price was. And he was starting to get interested at that point. So that prompted me to start looking at it. And it just so happened that the day I was looking at that business was the lowest that stock ever got <laughs> i sort of coincided with with the 52 week low on that one and i just couldn't do the work fast enough to get comfortable with it i was doing some um dcfs after some initial research and i was getting anywhere from like a 40 to 80 percent margin of safety at that price just on some rough work so perhaps in hindsight i should have just bought it but it went back up so quickly like i think it was up 10 or 15 percent the next day and just kind of kept doing that and it had doubled literally doubled a week after doing that work and that margin of safety just disappeared and then it's gone on to so i was looking around five dollars a share it's closer to twenty dollars a share now um, so i was there you go. i was actually looking at it at the same time so when the crash happened i was looking for some type of COVID play essentially and um i end up passing on corporate travel I'm not as optimistic about the long-term prospects as I don't know if you still are, Tom, but of course it worked out well temporarily. But um, yeah. they had some problems in the past with their management around some accounting fraud, which was a big red flag for me straight away. It was back in 2016. I'm not positive that management um, is still the same. I know the founder's still part of it, so obviously he's still involved. And I'm also not as confident as around corporate travel specifically. I think if any travel is going to be affected moving forward, it will be the business side of it. I don't think businesses yeah. are going to fly people out as much as they were when they've realized how much they can get done through Zoom, for example. Yeah. So I think mm -hmm. long term, that business might, unless they um, adjust a little bit, I think they could run into some problems long term. But of yeah. course, in hindsight, it was a great investment. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you just said. I don't think corporate travel is going to come back anywhere near as fast as leisure travel might. Um, but the price at the time was so compelling that that wouldn't have mattered. So um, yeah, that's right. That's that's where I was at with it. And, and now it's at a price where you do have to make some more optimistic assumptions about the future, which I'm not comfortable with doing. What yeah. about the airlines? Are any of you optimistic about the airlines doing well or? The, the enterprise values on some of those airlines are higher than they were pre-pandemic. The stock prices might be down, but they've taken on so much debt. I've done a video on this, and some of the cruise lines are the same. Yeah, They've taken on so much are. debt that the, 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 the enterprise values are just as high or almost higher in some cases. So um, that sort of made it a pass for me. I, I know Buffett, when he went into that investment, was expecting to 
earn a lumpy maybe 10 percent a year on the cost basis that he had at the time um and i'm assuming your thesis was somewhat similar Karan. but it's consolidated yeah, so, now, so. exactly yeah and, yeah yeah and actually bill miller asked warren buffett that question i think maybe two years before buffett made that investment so um yeah that, that's sort of where i'm at with it though i think the it's a hard one and, and the price is back up to a point now where again you have to make quite optimistic assumptions yeah i it's think airlines for them to um take off again it's not the same investment case for airlines at least like people are not factoring in how difficult it's going to be to pay off that debt i think mm -hmm. Mm. And and they were bad businesses for a long time, and they would just get into this point where some of the airlines at least had worked it out. Like I know Southwest, I don't know too much about it, but I know a lot of other investors talked about that company specifically. Of course, Buffett bought into, I think he had four of them, three or four yeah, in four. his portfolio. Um, they were just getting to a point where they seemed like they were going to become great businesses, and now this happened, and it's so unpredictable. There's so much debt. I just don't think it's a great time. I don't know how you could build too much conviction around it. Maybe, I guess the people that timed it at the actual lows did all right on the investment. I know cruise lines were the same way, but the dilution and debt that they've gone through, I think will be problematic for a long time. Yep, agreed. So I just looked at Southwest. I think they wasted Southwest. a lot of money on buybacks. That was a big mistake. Like the mm. only airline I think that didn't was Alaska, Alaska Air. And Southwest was quite, I, did they do as many buybacks? Not sure. I'm not sure. But Southwest, I think, is one of the better airlines, at least if someone's looking. So. Yeah, it was mentioned in um, was it mentioned in Richer, Wiser, Happier in Nick Sleep's chapter uh, as one of these scale economies shared businesses. Southwest was, and if you know if you'd bought Southwest ten years ago, it's done eighteen percent compound annual growth rate. So it's it's been a pretty solid performer over the last decade. Um, it, it, I know Pabrai was was in and out. I think fairly quickly back in like twenty sixteen or twenty seventeen. But right, uh, SC mentions there there's some interesting airport plays. I think Sven Carlin did a few videos about those uh, airport investments i haven't looked into that i looked into sydney, sydney sydney airport here in australia um mm -hmm. I, th I forget who it was that mentioned someone on a podcast maybe the focus compounding podcast was talking about it so i thought i'd take a look again it was around the time everything was cheap but i i just wasn't confident with it was a bit of a macro play i think at the time now at least things are normalizing slightly but i couldn't justify it just because of the macro considerations and they are high debt businesses typically as well. Yeah, I did the same for Auckland Airport and came to a similar conclusion. Um, got a question here. Which indu industries would you consider as being in your circle of competence? Anthony Hall. Uh, yeah, agriculture is probably the most, um, the first one that comes to mind. And then, um, I don't know this, that this is really an industry, but just the businesses that we come across in everyday life that I'm a customer of. So, um, you know, Mackie D's and and, uh, and uh, Domino's Pizza and so on would probably be on that list. And then, you know, the the obvious ones, the the Apples, Costco's, um, I'm forgetting a few examples, but, you know, the products that we use every day would be things that are, for the most part, think are my circle of competence, and then outside of that, probably agriculture for me, just because that's my um, my sort of formal background. Yeah, yeah I don't have an a... investor over time, of course, as you read, as you learn, as mm. you get into more yep. mistakes. <laughs> yeah, mm. I don't and have you can add things over time as well. Of course, that that's what I try to do. Is like I guess I'd have to say my main specialty, I guess, is education. I did a bit of business, which doesn't really apply to a certain industry, so education, but that would limit me so much if I only focus on education stocks. So I think it's important to expand your circle as much as possible. As long as the business is understandable and predictable, I don't think it matters what industry it is in specifically, as long as you can understand it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know that I'd say I understand any single entire industry 
Uh, it's more about products that I use, products that I'm interested in. Um, I let that kind of lead my competence. Mm. So or actually, actually wrap this the, one up. Or? Yeah. Yep. So I'm actually in the so, solar space, like work Solar. Wise. Yeah. So I kind of tend to avoid those businesses actually because I know how thin the margins can be. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes it's fun. confidence <laughs> can be yeah. the other way around. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny how that happens. I have very much the same thoughts on agriculture, like farming <laughs> businesses are not very high return companies Terrible. and you're um you're full of commodities in that industry as well. So <laughs> it's an unfortunate circle of confidence to have. <laughs> <laughs> and that too is still learning, you know, it's only been a few years, so yeah. We're gonna get hopefully we're gonna get better as investors over time. Yeah. Yeah. So. We'll we'll keep yeah. each other honest on that. Yeah, hundred percent. All right. Thank you all for a third episode of Punch Card Investing. And we will see you all next week. Hopefully, Jack will be back for that one. Until then, keep compounding. See ya. Thanks, everyone. Take care.